Geopolitics and Empire welcomes back to the podcast the renowned Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. We'll be getting his take on what's happening in the world. Thank you for being with us again, Mr. Faber. How has 2021 and the new abnormal been treating you? Well, everything is fine. As you may know, I have a house and I have my office adjacent to it on our land in the north of Thailand. And so I have plenty of land and trees and dogs and everything and food, which is uh, certainly also becoming important in today's world. And uh, at my age, actually, I don't particularly like to travel. I wanted to go to see some of my friends in Europe, which I couldn't. But other than that, I'm actually quite happy. And uh, I had the opportunity because of reduced activity outside the house. In other words, a lot of bars and restaurants are closed mm -hmm. uh, to actually uh, study things that interested me always. But I didn't have a chance while I was at school and university because I had so many other things to do. And as you know, at school, most people don't particularly like school because they have to do things in order to pass exams and not do things that actually interest them. So I've used this time to brush up my knowledge about history and about empires as well <laughs> and geopolitics well. and music. Well, so then uh, that's going to help us out, uh, help us out a lot here. So uh, I thought maybe we could start kind of uh, and get your insights uh, and start with this overarching theme of 2020 and 21 that is kind of overshadowing the rest of what's happening in regard to the global economy and, and politics. And that would be what I call, you know, what I'm fond of calling COVID-1984 uh, and its sibling the Great Reset, right? Uh, what the Davos crowd um, is is calling as a solution, global solution. You know, this fourth industrial revolution, these digital vaccine passports, these all all of these kinds of things that are being talked about. The governments around the world uh, seem, in, in coordinated fashion, uh, to be destroying their national economies, their middle class, repealing hard won civil liberties, and switching to authoritarian rule. In some ways, if we look at this historical cycle, the trend towards this was always there. It's kind of shocking how quickly it has come, at least in the Western world. Uh, I recently interviewed Gregory Copley, who is uh, head of a defense institute, who said that practically democracy is 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 finished. Uh, and so, you know, I saw this coming over a decade ago, which is why I decided to relocate to Mexico. Uh, how do you understand, you know, what's going on right now with this COVID and the government policies and this talk of these great reset? H how would you kind of ex explain all of this? Well, President Reagan, who wasn't a deep intellectual, but at least he had some common sense he once said the most uh, dangerous words are, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you. You understand? This is uh, uh, very clear throughout history that there has been a group of people that had uh, actually zilch interest in uh, having everybody vote, but having an interest in how to organize a society that benefits the so-called elite or the rulers the most, or how can you uh, govern a society to the best uh, that essentially keeps people reasonably happy, but at the same time enhances the power of the ruling class. And that has always been my impression. I had Okay, when I went to school, I was told, told that democracy is the best system. And that has been, hasn't been a disappointment because I always thought that, yeah, you can vote, but basically you have very little power. But uh, it's become clear to me in the last few years, and especially watching the elections in the US, that uh, actually democracies do not function. 
they lead to chaos. And when people say, well, it's the best the system of all the bad systems, to this I respond, well, under a feudal system, if someone, you know, whether it was the king or the emperor or uh, the feudals, if someone really messed up, he was responsible for his action and then his head was chopped off, period. And in a democracy, it's like in a board of directors, everybody can hide and say, well, it's somebody else's fault. You know, I also see it today with Credit Suisse. Nobody wants to stand up and says, I am the one who messed up this uh, credit and I messed up the risk control system. And this is the same in democracy. And then there is a big question, you know, who, as, as an example at the present time, we have a president in the US whose name is Mr. Biden. But actually, does he control what the US is doing? Does he control what the army is doing? Does he control what the, what the CIA is doing and the FBI? These are like, states within a state. So he, that's essentially where we stand. And under Trump, we had a big talker. But I don't think he would have wished to engage the US really in a war. At the present time, who knows? And we have to see something, you know, with this the Great Reset has already begun and began a while ago. Uh, the economies of the Western world are burdened with huge debts and they're burdened with huge governments as a percent of the economy. And uh, as a result of that, it's unlikely that they can grow much. In other words, these are, are not my inventions, and it's not statistics that I faked. They are official statistics by the Federal Reserve that actually kind of contradict the Federal Reserve's policies, which show clearly people at the age of 35 nowadays earn less than their parents when they were 35. In other words, people that... 50 years ago or so. So there has been a decline in the standards of living of the average person or the typical median household. They also have less assets than their parents had at the age of 30. So we can clearly see this is now the first generation in the history of capitalism in the U.S., in Europe, we had war. So during war times, you know, the standards of living of people in Germany and in France, in countries that were affected by the war, went down a lot. But they recovered also strongly naturally. But uh, in the US, we have now a generation of people that earn less and have less wealth than their parents had before. And now the government has to do something about this. You understand? They have to justify more interventions. So they print money. And the consequences of printing money throughout history has been poor, hasn't been good. Number two, they hand out money with the justification that some economists uh, recommend MMT, in other words, uh, a basic income and so forth, but this will all not work particularly well, except uh, what it has led to is a growing wealth and income inequi inequity. In other words, uh, from the crisis that began a year ago until today, 0.1% <laughs> of the population has become richer because stocks went through the roof and the majority of people, they don't own stocks, so they haven't done well at all on the contrary uh, and this is the tragedy that a democratically elected government can go to people and say you must close down your shop 
you must close down your small restaurant at the corner in your neighborhood. And you must close down the salon of your daughter who does nails and whatnot. And the tattoo salon has also to close. That this has been, and some people have been told, you must stay at home. You can't even go out on the street. In Britain, there was a case of someone who owned a house and a garden. So that's his land, his property. And on his property, he received a fine because he went smoking <laughs> outside the house. I mean, you shake your head. How is this? Well, it, that bad wasn't even the case under the regime of Hitler or Stalin or whoever. Yeah, in a it, democracy, you have to understand that. In a democracy, it's just hard to hard to 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 understand. Like what we this is what this is what we're experiencing. And, you know, and as you said, Canada, in the U.S., in Europe, and Australia, and New Zealand, that this is happening. You know, we're we're always told, oh, this happens in North Korea and in in well, Venezuela. And look, and yeah. and the populace just goes along. I'm just it blows my mind how people just go along. And they're not yes. res resisting. This is a very good point. And I want to tell you, if I were 40 and I was in my financial position that I am today, which wasn't at the time, I would launch a revolution in Europe or in the U.S. But then I look at the people. Even if my revolution would be successful, who do I actually fight for? I fight for a vogue society that wants women to be in the army, that wants uh, men, people that are born as men to compete as women in sports, you know, and so forth and so on. And I say to myself, F it. You know, I'm not interested to fight for something I don't believe in. Yeah, we've lost a lot of. Um those traditional uh values so um maybe we could then look forward i guess turn a bit towards the economy and i'm sure some of these issues will be popping up again um so then tr <laughs> to trans transition a bit to the economy i was listening to some of your interviews that you've given in the past and you've revealed how your portfolio structure is diversified between uh, you know, equities, real estate, precious metals, bonds, and cash. And, you know, I'm wondering about bubbles today. You know, what unnerves me are these new highs and records uh, in the markets. You have like the S&P that just broke a new record a few days ago. Property markets in Canada are bubblicious uh, right now. And you often talk about this. I suppose it has to do with, you know, the central, central bank money printing to infinity. Uh, how do you see... Uh, you know the market today at uh, these bubbles and 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 how and when this might uh, will, will all end or is it ending right now with the great reset well <laughs> it's a good question uh, let's put it this way governments or central banks which is the same nowadays there's no difference uh they are printing money. Uh, they can print as much money as they like. Uh, however, the money may not flow to the people they would like it to flow. In other words, uh, when you print money, the objecti objective might be to uh, improve the economy. But it may not happen because the money goes into, say, speculation, you know, or financial markets. It doesn't go to the normal people, to the simple people. It doesn't go into capital spending, especially if you have a government that says you can't open a restaurant, then nobody is interested to open a restaurant. In fact, there's negative capital spending in the current situation in the sense that many people are closing down their restaurants. But... Then you have the fiscal aspect where governments hand out money. And this money, you know, this is a, this is a big issue because 
we have determined in economics that if you look at the last 5,000 years of human history, with all its faults, the capitalistic system that we began about 200 years ago, say end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, that this has lifted the standards of living of all people. That we can say without any question, the poverty rate is today much lower than it's ever been, and people live longer, uh, they live healthier, they have by and large uh, enough food. Not everywhere, because the food, as you know, is not distributed evenly. But in principle, the world can feed, its, uh, it, uh, feed itself, which was never given in the past. We had periods of famine and extreme famines. Uh, we always talk about wealth inequality, but uh, as you know, when Mr. Slim drinks a Coca-Cola, he drinks exactly the same Coca-Cola as uh, a poorer family in a Mexico City slum would buy for their daughter. They shouldn't because it's bad, bad for the daughter's taste. But I'm saying there is a lot of wealth inequality, but most people nowadays, they have access to running water. Uh, some people have a golden toilet and some people have an ordinary toilet. But it's basically uh, a lot of things are available nowadays to the majority of people, which in the past were only available to the feudals, to the really upper class. And so the capitalistic system has led to a lot of prosperity. And I've been to Eastern Europe already in the 60s when I was racing for the Swiss ski team. And then in the 70s and 80s, I went also to Russia and China in the early days. I can tell you, it's very clear to me that uh, people... When I first went to Eastern Europe in about 65, we were very poor. And when I went in 68 to Czechoslovakia, I even stayed with the family. I tell you, I just couldn't believe that people still live in such poor conditions with, su with such low wages. And in 81, I went to Russia and everything was controlled and dark and in markets you know open air markets they were selling tomatoes and apples that were rotten rotten I don't exaggerate and there were lines of people in front of these rotten tomatoes and apples this is what socialism and communism does and the capitalistic system has many failures. I do not dispute that, but at least it creates a distribution center, distribution system that enables people to buy quality goods at relatively, I'm saying relatively low prices. And it allows people to choose a job, to do this or that occupation and so forth. So under that system, and I've seen it also in China, and the Ch Mao Zedong, China was very poor. Deng Xiaoping opens the door in 78. And today, 40 years later, China has still some poor people. But the majority, the vast majority, is much better off than they were 40 years ago. Uh, there are 140 million Chinese that can travel overseas every year. They can choose where they want to go. They can choose where they want to work. They can choose what they want to eat. So when people always bitch about China, they overlook this fact. And uh, this is the big danger, you know, when you talk about geopolitics. The rise of Asia, and I wrote in 2001 a book, uh, tomorrow's gold, Asia's 
age of discovery, in other words, the growth of Asia. And uh, it's amazing that when you look at, say, history, 1950, uh, China was extremely poor because they just had just come out of a civil war. And you look at them today, and you look at the size of the economy, 1.3 billion consumers. And you look at the size of some of their companies. Of course, uh, for an imperialistic country like the US, they are a threat to, to the world dominance of the US. That is no question about this. I don't think they want to use that th uh, threat, but it is very clear that there are a few things the Chinese don't want, and they will fight for it. Number one, uh, they don't want the U.S. to expand their military bases in Asia, which means uh, whatever happens in Myanmar at the present time, and I'm sure the U.S. has a hand in it, like they always have a hand whenever there is a problem, uh, the Chinese, they consider it as their sphere of influence, and nothing will change that. Number two, Tibet is also an uh, area the US and Britain would have loved to have under their essentially sphere of influence, because they could have put uh, military and uh, aerospace bases there, rocket bases, so that the Chinese will never give up. And Xinjiang province, which is in the west of China, uh, which is talked about a lot because they talk about concentration camps and this and that and so forth. That province, the Chinese will not let go. Because they, again, they don't want to have any military bases there. And finally, they will not let North Korea go. You know, so these are things. It's like the Russians will not let NATO install military bases in Ukraine. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I, and on this, um, on this note, that was one of my questions. Um, we see the U.S. empire becoming very aggressive now, especially against, uh, as you mentioned, Russia in, in Ukraine uh, in Crimea um, and against China. We had that meeting recently in Alaska where China admonished <laughs> the U.S. and they said they will not be spoken down to. And right after that, the Russians came out and said the same thing. You will not speak down to us anymore. So now we, it's like we finally see this shift now where it's becoming a multipolar world. Uh, the dragon bear Eurasia is is rising, rising. And as you mentioned, you know, the, 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 the West is on terminal uh, decline. And so, you know, how do you see this? The tables have turned. So how do you see this going forward uh i mean it's it could become very dangerous do you see the potential for um a great power conflict another world war you know uh around <laughs> taiwan or the, they're sending troops now uh, I, i'm sure the biden administration and, and nato are approving ukraine's actions right now on the border uh with russia and the donbass so they might start a conflict there so you know go, going forward how do you see this playing out well, I, I think if you look at uh, wars, uh, nations that are kind of desperate or that are likely to lose their position of hegemony, like Britain, economically it was overtaken already by Germany in 1910. You know, they, they were worried that Germany would become a big industrial power and I suspect the U.S. also. So I have a simple method. Uh, you look at the map of countries before a conflict and after a conflict. Say, so if you look at the Middle East in uh, 1900, the map looks like the Ottoman Empire controls most of the Middle East. 
Then there was the Arab uprising, of which they made a big movie, Lawrence of Arabia. It's actually a very good movie, and I recommend it to watch. And it is uh, has some historical basis. And but after the First World War, the map of Europe looks uh, end of the Middle East looks very different than before, and after the Second War, a lot different as well. So whereas before 1900. There was not a single military base in Europe and the Middle East uh, of the U.S. After the First World War, there were some, and especially after the Second World War. If you look at Asia, Tito, after the Second World War, they had uh, military bases all over the place. So I think the U.S., when you talk that the U.S. could become aggressive, I have to say, you look at the American-Spanish War, <laughs> American-Mexican War. I think they've always been aggressive. They always had this uh, attitude, or they used it as an excuse: "We bring good to the world." This American exceptionalist, we bring heaven to the world because we are Americans. We are good people. <laughs> yeah, whenever I hear the good people, I have to laugh. And uh, the Trump administration, to be fair to him, he kicked out some of the really bad neocons. Not enough. But now, number three at the State Department of Mr. Biden is again Victoria Nuland. Victoria Nuland hates Putin. She will do anything she can to embarrass him, to annoy him. You understand? This is the American way. The Americans tried to embarrass China already in 2019 with the demonstration of students, which I know because I have uh, a very good friend of mine is the student leader. <laughs> so I know this. They financed it. They supplied them with goods and so forth. So uh, this will continue, I'm sure, especially under the Biden administration. Because Mr. Biden, I don't think he realizes entirely what he's doing. You, you know, so uh, the People that are under him are kind of, uh, a lot of them are sleaze bags from the Obama administration. Obama probably runs the government behind the scene. That's why he also stayed in Washington. And then there's still some influence by the Clintons and so forth. Epstein is out of the picture. <laughs> you know, otherwise he also be involved. <laughs> So in another picture, uh, and I think what you mentioned, I actually just wrote the report. Uh, how likely is that the war between China and America breaks out? I think it all it would take is someone loses his patience. You know, the, the Americans, the CIA may do things that the State Department doesn't want, but they may not know about it. And so forth. So there's lots of organizations that can do things. Also in the case of China, <coughs> maybe a general says Xi Jinping is too soft. We need to do something. So let's shoot down a few American airplanes or let's bomb or sink an American aircraft carrier. You know what this would do in America? The Chinese sinking one aircraft carrier would have a huge impact. And so there is this anti-Asian uh, sentiment in America. I think it's uh, very distressing. I'm not Asian and so forth, but I live in Asia and I'm married to an Asian. But I think in general, to steer up anti-Asian sentiment in America is very bad. Because actually, 
the Asians in America are the ones, along with the Hispanics, who work the most. They are the ones who actually work. And they are the ones that actually succeed economically, like the Hispanics, because they work and save. But then you have uh, other people who use the system and they hate the Asians precisely because they're successful. Mm -hmm. And to look at uh, another aspect of the, of the power of, of the empire, which is, you know, the global reserve, uh, the U.S. dollar, you know, people talk about hyperinflation of the dollar um, and, and its decline and it, it being replaced. Now we have the IMF stepping out with, you know, it's printing, it's promotion of these special drawing rights. There's the people talk about the petro yuan, the digital uh, yuan and uh, the gold backed petro yuan and so how do you see how do you say the, the future of of the world reserve uh, and the dollar well i think that uh, karl popper he wrote about this already uh, but uh, previously david ricardo wrote that there would be far fewer wars if the people that go to war actually would have to pay right away for the war. You understand? In other words, you can't borrow to go to war. You have to pay through tax increases. And I agree. Uh, Popper, he then wrote that, you know, you have all these uh, interventions and so forth, and uh, that the expansion in monetary policies essentially lead to imperialism and militarism, because just think about it. If I can print money and I can borrow money at zero interest rates, uh, what uh, does uh, it, uh, it doesn't exactly restrain me from starting a war. It doesn't cost anything right away. It will cost uh, in the future, but not right away. So people uh, are much more likely to go to war than, uh, than uh, if you had tight monetary policies and the policy of a strong dollar. But very clearly what you said is going to occur. The role of the dollar, of the US dollar, as an international reserve currency is going to disappear. It's a question of time. Is it going to be in three months or in 10 years? But I think the role of the US dollar will diminish. The dollar will lose value. Maybe not against the euro, because the euro is also sick currency run by sick governments who may not be much better than the US government. Uh, in fact, some of them seem to be brain damaged as well. So they are, they are a very good match for Biden. But uh, the dollar and the euro and other currencies, including the Mexican peso and so forth, they may lose value against uh, solid cryptocurrencies and precious metals. And they have lost the value against the Dow Jones, cash against the Dow Jones, and against, uh, say, uh, real estate, which you mentioned at the beginning, going through the roof in Canada. Actually, if you said to me 20 years ago, Mark, is it possible that we are in a depression and stocks and real estate go through the roof? I would have said, Yes, if they print money in an unlimited and unresponsible way. But you have to see now, today they announced statistics in the U.S. which support recent statistics that show that the U.S. economy is recovering strongly. That is not uh, on the question. The question is, after this rebound, which is due to money printing, what is next. In my opinion, they have no ch no other option but to print more money. The result might be poor because uh, 
the interest rates, as you know, on the 10 years US Treasury is up three times from August 2020, from less than uh, 0.50 to now over 1.5. So some people like experts like like Jim Rickards, who published his last book, The New Great Depression. So, you know, do you think do you think we'll be that we will begin to see in the US uh, what some of my past guests have called like Dmitry Orlov, the like a Soviet style collapse or something like this, like something that the Soviets uh, experienced Russia in the 1990s uh, that <laughs> in, the, in the US we might get. Um, in a new Great Depression or, 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 or something? Uh... Well, the fact is that under the U.S. regime at the present time, the money that is being printed and handed out does not go towards the construction of bridges and tunnels and factories but it goes towards consumption and towards speculation. There are lots more, lots more people are speculating now in the world than uh, before. Now you may say, well, you know, I know this guy, he's made a few million dollars uh, buying and selling cryptos and so forth. Yeah, it's gonna, it, it does happen. It's like I know a guy, He's won a million dollars on in the lottery, <laughs> but not many of <laughs> not many people live, win a lot in the lottery. You understand? So I think we are in a situation where we live in a period of money illusion, and people are confused. A nobody knows who to trust. You read something in the paper, nobody has a clue: is it true or is it false? The government says something. Uh, the primary assumption is that they're lying. But not everybody thinks that way. You know, depending whether you're a Democrat or a Republican in the US, you may believe different things. But people are confused. And whether we will have a Soviet type of collapse is possible. I wouldn't rule it out. And uh, <clears throat> I think. I observed already in 2018 that the global economy was slowing down. And then in 2019, it was still growing, but at the slower pace. And we had COVID and the monetary injections and so forth. But it would seem to me that uh, this is all artificial stimulus and that this will then lead to renewed weakness. When this renewed weakness comes in the U.S., this will be the danger point geopolitically. Because then, you know, things go bad in the U.S., you need to blame it. 150 years ago, they would have blamed it on Mexico. <laughs> now they blame it on Russia, on China on Iran, you know, anyone they can find, anyone. And they will go in somewhere. Uh, they may not go in directly. They may uh, kind of instigate a false flag somewhere or a provocation that gives the excuse of a reaction by China. So it will be interesting. We are in a trade war with China, in an economic war. This has begun already, very clearly. It's sad, but this is the reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether you can blame the Chinese for everything, I doubt. Uh, they have also made some mistakes and so forth. But in general, you look at China, how many military bases do they have outside of China? They don't have military bases. They have now a port in Sri Lanka and in uh, Kabar in Pakistan. 
but other than that, they basically have nothing. Yeah, and I think Djibouti. Uh, you mentioned uh, cryptocurrencies, and on your website, I noted recently um, you included in one of your recent reports, you said uh, uh, an essay by Mark E. Yevtovich, uh, who I'm a fan of on cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, on cryptos, the sentiment seems to be love or hate. Uh, there's great potential for upside as well as downside. I'm a bit wary of digital currency because of how these new systems might or could relate to the tyrannical plans you know, of the, of the Davos crowd down the line. Some like Ray Dalio are worrying the government could uh, attempt to ban or outlaw Bitcoin. Others like Max Kaiser say Bitcoin can be, cannot be defeated and it can become a sort of a new global currency. Either way, it seems the tech, uh, this technology is here to, to stay. And so we have Bitcoins in the private space on one hand, but then we have now, I think 80% of the world's governments uh, are investigating these central bank digital currencies uh, as well, which some say could lead to some kind of, you know, dystopian social credit system uh, model. <laughs> and so um, some people say that the governments are too incompetent to be able to implement this su successfully. So we have now this, you know, Bitcoin and the cryptos, and then we have central bank digital currencies. So kind of what, what's your take on this uh, space? Well, I agree with the remark that they may be too incompetent to implement cryptocurrencies. But I have to say about this remark, the governments have been very clever and uh, very good and very intelligent at looking after themselves. That I want to point out. Whether they're capable to look after everybody in the system, they're not, because very clearly the market economy is an anti-government system. The capitalistic system is anti-government. It's Darwinism. But they, Keynes also admitted it uh, openly, that uh, his economic policies and views would be more likely to succeed if it were if they were implemented in a socialist system, in a totalitarian system, in other words. But uh, the, the danger is, of course, and I have to say, they can also declare paper money as worthless, or they can make it become worthless. They can also take your gold away and they can take your property away. There are two ways. Either you have high property taxes where people can't afford to live in nice homes anymore and so forth. You have to farm them out. Or they can make your life in a big villa very unpleasant by forcing you to, lo to lodge illegal immigrants in your villa in the Hamptons or in Newport Beach, you understand? Know All possible, whereby the rich people, they will have different rules than ordinary people. But so, uh, you know, governments, once they go down the path of evil, which most of them eventually do, uh, are very unpredictable. Regarding cryptocurrencies, yeah, this is uh, true. The government, through cryptocurrencies, uh, they can do that already to a large extent because people use credit cards. But say, I pay normally with cash. So if I go to a bar or to a restaurant or wherever it is, uh, I can pay with cash. And the government is not able to track that cash. But with cryptos and with credit cards, they can track that down. Or with... Uh, prepaid cards on your telephone, they can track that. So there's a lot that can be tracked already. I mean, the Mexican cartels, they know exactly about this. That's why they keep a lot of cash in their homes. <laughs> and, and, and so then, um, I mean, any other thoughts on the, on the crypto space, like, like um, Bitcoin, uh, people feel it's going to save us, uh, uh, and then, you know, these, these central bank digital currencies, they, they seem to be kind of like the central bank's answer to what you were talking about before, this, this hyper money printing collapse that, that would come. And then they kind of installed these 
digital controls. Uh, and in some cases, I guess, like if you don't do what the government wants, <laughs> they can just turn off the, your, your digital money, no? Correct. Correct. That they can do. And they will do it. And so it's like Warren Buffett, he said, you know, I like to invest in companies that are full foolproof. In other words, he said, sooner or later, every company will have a CEO that is an idiot. I want the company to survive even the idiots. Well, you know, Credit Suisse is an example of having several idiots as CEOs for now 15 years, and it survived, <laughs> but barely so. So I think that uh, the question is really, do you want to launch a crusade to save the system? Because you are, have to ask yourself, I saved the system, but for whom? For the Vogue society? For people that are ingrained uh, or brainwashed into socialist theories, 65% uh, of young people, they think the government should do more, not less. You know that? For that, I'm not willing to fight. Then the, the question arises, uh, do I want to be part of such a system? It's like when you were in Germany and Hitler came to power, if you disagreed with his policies, there was an option for you to depart. But of course, some people said, I am a German. I disagree with the policies, but I stay because I'm a patriot. There were people like that. And among the famous people that were later attacked that they didn't leave and so on. Anyway, but you could leave a country where you feel that things will turn bad or <coughs> you stay at, uh, you say, I stay. But you have to be aware that sooner or later the government will come and blackmail you about something. Uh, so you will lose a lot of your freedom. And uh, you have to then consider, well, I'm wealthy or medium wealthy or very wealthy. What do I do with my assets? Uh, to that, I respond, you have to be diversified and internationally diversified. So, you know, you can maybe move somewhere else. But in a war, most people lose out, except the, the weapon dealers and so forth, and the war profiteers, and you don't want to belong into that group. So maybe we all have to think, how do I want to structure my life to stay reasonably comfortable and happy under much worse conditions than we live at the present time? And that would include uh, maybe diminishing your standards of living. Yeah, th that was one of my... Not a pleasant thought, but it's uh, something we have to consider. I mean, it's better that I'm kind of locked into my house and office, have plenty of space. I can walk around the garden for ages if I want to. I'm not feeling like it. I'd rather drink a beer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the... the it's better than to be sent to a forced labor camp, I suppose. Although some people say, well, they learned a lot in a forced labor camp and they had under all negative conditions, they had kind of a interesting time and it was a life experience. Same, some people went to jail, they came out and they said they've learned about uh, themselves a lot, you know, so they're different philosophical views, but I would say uh, I don't think that given the current economic conditions, the money printing, the arrogance of Western governments and especially of the neocons in the US, and to be fair, also some arrogance on the part of the Chinese, that this will end all very well. Y you understand? I think we will have to maybe get used to having a tanker in the Suez Canal <laughs> blocking the, the trade uh, for many years. 
And we have maybe to live with the fact that we'll have permanent lockdowns and so forth. And so, only privileged people will get the second vaccine and the third vaccine and so forth. At the end, only the elites can still travel around in the private planes. Yeah, that, that, paid that, by the taxpayers. I, I, I've had this the same uh, feeling as you described. Uh, that leads me to my last two, two, two questions. So, and this picture that you've painted for us, um, you know, this environment <laughs> you go, mean, going optimistic view, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, for the everyday person, and I agree with you, kind of what you're describing is, is what I've been seeing as, as well. And so how would, uh, given this context going forward around the world in many countries, the average person try to protect, you know, themselves from whether it's the fallout of potential military conflicts, you know, their own country becoming to some extent authoritarian, uh, you know, energy, access to energy, food inflation, devaluation of currencies. You know, I'm, I'm often told uh, you want to have, as, as you do, you know, farmland becoming self-sustainable, uh, owning real things such as precious metals, having some kind of productive business. So, you know, apart from also subscribing to the gloom, boom and doom report, uh, what would, what would <laughs> you say? You. What, Thank what, you for the advertising. <laughs> yeah, so what would you say are some other key principles, you know, people could take in going forward to try and protect themselves? I'd say you have to kind of prepare yourself for a different life. And in this respect, I just like to say, in Switzerland, I have four friends that were uh, well paid. They were all between 46 years old and uh, 61. They lost uh, their jobs, my opinion, but there's no chance in a million years they will find a job again at the same salary. Maybe they can work for the government somewhere in a lowly paid position. I don't know. But uh, it would seem to me that also these people, some of them may never again find a job. Then you have to say it to yourself, maybe this can happen to me as well. You know, I was banned by the U.S. media. So, because I have lots of other interests, it didn't touch me very much. But, you know, for someone who goes to the office every day from nine to five and is used to that kind of life and suddenly at 50 or 55, someone tells me, no, uh, you're terminated. Hey, he may not, he gets his salary maybe for another three to six months, but afterwards, He's essentially an empty-handed. And if he has debts, then he might be in trouble and so forth. Uh, so th these are aspects that you have to consider, that you may lose your job. Number two, uh, the best way, you know, to survive life is that along your life, a lot of doors close. They are closed because... Uh, you lose friends and you lose your parents and you lose relatives and so forth. And so life is not static, but you have to constantly adapt to new situations. And I would say the best is as you age and as you may lose your job is to find an occupation you enjoy. Now, you may enjoy studying philosophy or you may enjoy uh, day trading the whole day. I doubt this is a very fruitful of occupation. But maybe you enjoy uh, collecting butterflies or whatnot. You, you understand? What I want to say is if you have a nine to five job or whatever, you always have to entertain the possibility that uh, you may lose it. And what is then your plan B? And frequently, it is better to prepare for plan B before the disaster strikes. Mm -hmm. And I guess I have uh, one more question then. Looking around the world, given everything that, that you've laid out, you know, 
what countries, uh, jurisdictions, or economies uh, appeal to you uh, in terms of you know economic potential, whether you want to invest or, or to move there for their economic potential, uh, as well as freedom uh, and, and civil liberties. You know, what jurisdictions stand out to you? Well, as a general answer, I would say anything but America. This is the one country I would never move to under no circumstance. In terms of civil liberties, uh, we have to distinguish. I don't believe in democracies. So I was perfectly happy to live in uh, Hong Kong uh, from 72, uh, 73 to 97. It was under British. It wasn't a democracy. It was ruled by a benevolent dictator. The governor that was essentially appointed by the Queen of England. And it had a bureaucracy that were British who were relatively honest and who were perfectly happy to play cricket and drink <laughs> a lot in the evenings and not bother people. And so you had, uh, and Hong Kong was elected. For many years in a row, as among the top two, three economic freest countries in the world, freest. And it wasn't the democracy and so forth. And in China, people always say, I is a dictator and they're uh, communists and so forth. You have to once uh, look at how the Communist Party is elected and who gets to the top. It's a one-party system, I admit. But basically, within the Communist Party, it's a meritocracy to a large extent, not exclusively. You know, it's like who gets into Harvard and Yale. People used to be on meritocracy, but it also used to be a little bit on money. You know, and if the papa and the grandfather were there and they gave a lot of money into the endowment, it was helpful, let's say, put it that way, and so forth. And uh, uh, in, but in China, you know, you have a large meritocracy, and you have a lot of personal freedom, but you have to stay out of politics. I mean, you can't go and uh, run through the streets with a banner down with Xi Jinping and free the Uyghurs and uh, down with the forced labor and so forth. Just keep quiet. I live in Thailand. It's not a free country because we are ruled by the king, basically, and you can't say anything against the king, uh, which I understand. That's okay. But, uh, you know, the interpretation is if you argue with the police, well, it could be interpreted as arguing with the king because the police is under the king. <laughs> so, uh, you, as a, especially as a foreigner, you better shut up mm -hmm. about local politics. But I'm used to that, and I don't resent that so badly. My business is not in Thailand. I have no business in Thailand. I own the land and so forth. But, uh, my businesses are outside. In Switzerland, I have a, I used to have a relatively perfect democracy, but you understand the police has a lot of power and some people have a lot of power. And uh, in a small mountain village, if you are a person from the city in Switzerland, uh, the small mountain village, will be very difficult for you as a Swiss, same country, from the city. Like, you live in Mexico, correct? Yeah. So, you know, you have Mexico City, but in a small village in the south or in the uh, northwest, maybe the people don't care, don't give a S about the Mexican government in Mexico City. They have their own laws, have their own landlord, uh, their own boss, and so forth, so, you know. Mm -hmm. 
we all have to live with some restrictions. It's never an endless freedom. Yeah, I agree with you. As as long as I was living in Kazakhstan for a number of years recently, and similar kind of situation, but. You know, if you leave the government alone, they kind of leave you alone. And if you have, you know, you have your economic freedom and you go on uh, with your life. Um, do you have any final thought then to leave us with for 2021 going forward? <laughs> yes, that's a general rule. Whether you're in Kazakhstan or the U.S. or China or Southeast Asia, never go out with the girlfriend of a cartel boss or a party boss, <laughs> or a Washington politician. That is the final thought on geopolitics. <laughs> okay, all right. That's a good, good, okay. good, good advice. Um, so the best place to, to visit you is gloomboomanddoom.com, correct? A any other projects? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank um, you. Okay, well, uh, some of the best contrarian uh, analysis uh, you will find on the planet uh, is there. So follow Mark Faber's thank work. You. And thanks for being on Geopolitics and Empire again. Well, thank you very much. And have a nice Easter. Today is Easter Friday, right? Yes, yes. Good Friday. Yes, indeed. Who can knows how long we can still celebrate Good Friday. <laughs> yeah, pretty soon they might outlaw Christianity. Who knows? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely, yes. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast interview. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list through which you can receive an update of every new podcast, as well as a long list of key news headlines once a week. We're being heavily censored. YouTube has deleted some of our videos, and we currently have one strike. Patreon has terminated our account. Facebook has restricted our page and Reddit has been the leading posts. Our favorite social media channels are Telegram and Twitter. The best places to watch the podcast beyond YouTube are on Odyssey, BitChute and Brighteon. The best places to listen to the podcast are on SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, Google or on any other podcast app. To help keep this podcast alive, Leave a review on Apple Podcasts and wherever else. Subscribe to all our platforms and leave a donation if possible via Subscribestar, PayPal, Bitcoin, or Ethereum. You can also find us on MeWe, Minds, Gab, Float, VK, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thanks for listening.